Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Moser, professor of history and co-chair of the Master of Arts in American History and Government program here at Ashland University. Welcome to our second season of Documents in Detail. Uh, well, we are about halfway into that now. This is our special holiday edition of Documents in Detail, teachingamericanhistory.org's webinar series. In each episode, we're doing a deep dive into a single document discussing the historical, literary, and rhetorical aspects of said document, while also analyzing its impact on American history, people, and thought. TeachingAmericanHistory.org is a project of the Ashbrook Center, a nonpartisan nonprofit based at Ashland University. We provide a variety of programs and resources for teachers of American history, government, and civics, all based on primary documents. In the next week, you will receive an email with a link to request a certificate of participation suitable for framing, as well as a link to the archived video and audio from today's program. To help us begin to think about the topics of this year's webinars, we are drawing speeches, letters, and writings from the Ashbrook Center's voluminous document database available at TAH.org. And you too can join in the discussion by typing your questions into the chat window at the bottom of your screen at any time. The subject of today's program, of course, is, American, is, is Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. And to help discuss it are Dr. Dan Monroe, Associate Professor, and John C. Griswold, Distinguished Professor of History at Millican University, and Dr. Jonathan White, Associate Professor of American Studies at Christopher Newport University. Dan, John, welcome, and thank you for being here tonight. Thanks so much for having us. And I, and, I, and I want to thank you in particular for selecting documents that are brief, considering we're at the end of the semester, and uh, as I'm sure you are, I am buried with grading. So uh, why don't we dive into these documents? Uh, Gettysburg Address, I mean, what, what more famous document of American history, I guess aside from the Declaration of Independence, can there, could there possibly be? Generations of school children are taught to memorize this, uh, uh, this, this speech, and it's brief enough to be memorized uh, fairly easily. Uh, why has this become such an iconic uh, piece of American rhetoric? And I address this to whichever of you wishes to speak first. I'll let Dan start off. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I think part of it is, and it's often, uh, I think, forgotten or not part of the story is, uh, one of the reasons the address is, is, uh, has become so much a part of the national memory is that Gettysburg, the site, became part of the kind of sectional reconciliation, a very important part of the sectional reconciliation that occurred after the war. You know, David Blight has written in a fine book about this. But the whole idea was, how do you get the two sections to come together? And one aspect of this was that the... Um, uh, the Battle of Gettysburg was seen as a kind of uh, turning point, and therefore was was viewed as 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 time went on, as a place that would be a natural site for events associated with the reconciliation. You know, it was at Gettysburg, uh, famously, where the the uh, veterans of the war at the beginning of the 20th century, Union and Confederate veterans, came together and kind of ceremoniously crossed the field where Pickett made his famous charge. And then instead of, you know, re when they got together, instead of shooting at each other, <laughs> as they had in 1863, they shook hands. Um, so part of, you know, as part of that process, I think the Gettysburg Address uh, was also elevated into the national consciousness. Now, that's to take nothing away from Lincoln's achievement, Lincoln's words, which I think are quite significant. But the, if the question is, as you framed it was, you know, how, what, you know, why did why did this become so memorable? I think part of it is because Gettysburg, as a site of the the battle, uh, became uh, so much a part of the national consciousness with its importance in the sectional reconciliation that starts uh, after 1870 and kind of proceeds apace. John, carry out anything to that? Yeah, I I think that Dan is is certainly right about that and. The reality, though, is that also the address started to gain widespread attention very early on. You had 
great thinkers in New England writing about having read about it in the newspapers and seeing the incredible words of Lincoln within 20 or 24 months of 18 of November 1863 you even have it starting to appear in uh, elocution books for kids for school kids it's something that they'll start memorizing very early on even as late as near the end of the Civil War and I remember as I, I wrote a history of of dreams during the Civil War and and one of the chapters focuses on Lincoln and I wanted to get at this question of why is Lincoln why does he loom so large in American history? And uh, why do Americans view him in almost mythical uh, proportions? And that view of Lincoln really begins to emerge around the time of his death. And I found one instance in 1868 where Lincoln's Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, was at a political rally in Pennsylvania for the Republican Party. And he read the Gettysburg Address to this rally. And then he said, those are the words of God through the lips of Abraham Lincoln or speaking through the lips of Abraham Lincoln. So very early on, people begin to notice that there's something in this speech, that it, it captures something about the American experiment in a way that others have not captured it. There's almost something divine about uh, Lincoln's message in the speech. Hmm. Very interesting. So clearly this is something that uh, in the in the in the months following his death, really take on takes on this this legendary status. Uh, maybe the two of you could take us back to uh, the, obviously the speech takes place about four and a half months after the battle. Um, is is it is it determined almost immediately afterward that this is going to be a uh, that this is going to become a, 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 a cemetery, or is this just obvious because a, a battle of such magnitude has taken place here that that's what this is going to going to become? Because after all, the context for this is the dedication of this uh, of this of this battle cemetery, and I'm wondering if either of you could provide some backstory on that. I, I could take a shot at that if John doesn't mind. Sure, my colleague. I mean, Go I'll, ahead, I mean you feel in. yeah, feel free to <laughs> feel free to fill in any gaps in my account but uh, uh, you know of course after the the battle was a terrible um, marked by terrible carnage you know thousands of dead men and of course the armies moved on and the dead were hastily buried and there was uh, by the by the um, late summer early fall um, the hasty uh, burial of the uh, of the, the soldiers that expired wasn't wearing well, you know, there were corpses and or portions of corpses that were protruding from the ground. They'd been rooted out by pigs and other animals. And there was a real concern that this was going to be a humanitarian, you know, or, or rather a kind of uh, crisis of hygiene. And so that was really the basis for the beginning of this uh, cemetery movement was actually uh, interring the dead in a way that would be um, provided in a more sanitary way, but also in a more I think, uh, in keeping with the kind of culture of uh, death in the Antebellum period, in a way that would be more memorable and appropriate. Um, you know, I think Gary Wills in his uh, wonderful book on the dress talks about the culture of death in the Antebellum period, the rural cemetery movement, uh, the idea of interring the dead in places that were in nature and that therefore would have a kind of efficacious effect on the living as they contemplate eternity. I mean, that, that kind of ideology forms the basis for the creation of the cemetery at, uh, at Gettysburg. And then the solemnity in which it was dedicated was also typical of that culture. Um, you know, putting the dead in a place where, uh, of reverence, uh, but also a place of content, potential contemplation for the living, um, uh, as opposed to the what was regarded as the staleness of the old uh, churchyard cemetery. So... Um, Hey, go ahead, John, if you want to add to that or anything. Yeah, sure. There's a very good historian named Mark Shantz who teaches down in Birmingham, and he has a book called Awaiting the Heavenly Country. And it was published by Cornell University Press, uh, maybe actually the same year as Drew Faust's book on death during the Civil War. And he has a slightly different take on the creation of the cemetery and its relationship to the rural cemetery movement. If you look at rural cemeteries, you might think of Mount Auburn Cemetery in, in Cambridge, which is the first major rural cemetery in that antebellum movement. And if you were to walk through a rural cemetery, you'll see 
lots of beautiful vistas. You'll see walkways, horticulture. The monuments are all very different from one another, reflecting the the life or the wealth of the person who's buried there. And um, they're made to be, as I think you're right, Gary Wills describes, they're made to be these places of, of civic engagement where young people are, they go to the cemeteries to learn about the past, to appreciate their forebears, to take care of the cemetery grounds and to make sure that they are, um, that they're well taken care of and, and loved and cherished. And within that context, um, you'll never have an unknown burial at a rural cemetery because the families own the bodies. The families own the burial plots. Oftentimes they have small family plots within this larger cemetery. And you'll never have an unknown burial because uh, everyone is buried there by someone who loves them. And not only that, the, the cemeteries are very in a, they show a lot of inequality. They show the personality of the people who are buried there and they show the wealth of the people who are buried there. And one thing that Shantz argues that I think is a really valuable contribution to understanding the Gettysburg Address and the Gettysburg National Cemetery is that the National Cemetery model is actually very different from the rural cemetery model. You're not going to have winding paths and ponds and lots of trees and beautiful vistas as you meander through a national cemetery. Everything is uniform. Everything is equal. The headstones are what we now know as typical military headstones. And they show an egalitarianism that begins to emerge with the military cemetery movement, I guess you could say, during the Civil War. These men are all equal. There are unknowns, unlike in a rural cemetery. You're going to have a lot of unknowns in a military cemetery. And um, they now no longer belong to their families. Chance argues, and I think quite persuasively, they now belong to the nation. They're on a military plot of land. They're, the cemeteries are cared for by the military. And and you can connect that to something like the Gettysburg Address, where Lincoln talks about these men who laid down their lives that the nation might live. At the same time that Lincoln is talking about these men making a sacrifice for the nation, there's also a new turn in the way men will be buried after they've died in service of the nation. That's fascinating. What um, Are there... Are there stories? Uh, are, we, are there uh, uh, similar? Uh, were there similar cemeteries established at, for instance, Antietam and the sites of other battles uh, as, as as soon after the battle as the as the case of Gettysburg? I don't know that they were as soon after the battle. There are a number spread throughout the nation now, and many of them rooted in the Civil War. There was a lot of reinterring of the dead in the years after the war. And so, for instance, at Yorktown National Battlefield, which is a Revolutionary War battlefield, there are a ton of Civil War soldiers um, who were reinterred there later. Um, there's, of course, a major one at Andersonville, which was a prison in Georgia during the war. I don't know off the top of my head when they were created. Dan, I don't know if you know. Right. Uh, I, I don't. Um, I, I know it's a it's an ongoing thing in the late nineteenth century, and Gettysburg mm -hmm. is kind of the model. Yeah, I think that's right. Okay, so let's uh, let's move on to the address itself, or at least the the event at which the address was given. Um, we uh, I I am told that uh, it, the the real headliner of the day was was not Lincoln but Edward Everett, uh, who gave a a, a long stem winder of a speech that is entirely forgotten today. Um, and you then don't have Lincoln, it memorized, John? No, I'm afraid <laughs> I do not. Uh, and then uh, we have merely what, what really looks like a fragment from Lincoln. Why keep it so short? That was his role. He was invited famously to give a few appropriate remarks. Edward Everett was the main speaker for the day. The reason they had the date as late as November 19th was because Edward Everett said he needed that amount of time to be able to compose his address. And Everett was 
one of the most famous orators of 19th century America. He had been a cabinet officer in the 1850s. He'd been a senator. I think he'd been an ambassador, professor at Harvard. He was someone people wanted to go hear. And uh, his way of writing a speech was that he would research it very deeply. So he spent time touring the battlefield, trying to learn what happened, who was involved, where and when. He wanted to know the story and and tell some of those stories in his speech. And from what I understand, his style was he would write out this long speech. He would have a thick stack of papers in front of him. He would walk to the podium, kind of put put the papers down so they were all nice and straight, lay them down in front of him, and then ostentatiously proceed to deliver a two and a half hour speech from memory. He didn't need the papers, but he wanted you to know how long the speech was. And, and, but people wanted to go hear that. That's what they, they wanted. Lincoln had a very different responsibility. His wasn't to be the long keynote. His was to um, give a few appropriate dedicatory remarks. But Edward Everett then later noted that Lincoln did far more in his 272 words than Everett had done in his two and a half hours. Mm. Dan, you care to add to that? I mean, that, that's absolutely right. Um, and this was typical of the, of the spirit of the age, so to speak. I mean, to have these long-winded addresses, uh, which undergraduates now find so vexing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and Everett was a great headliner. I mean, he was with the, arguably the most celebrated orator of the time, um, just as John su suggested. And uh, also correctly, Lincoln's, Lincoln's pithiness was a product of his role in following Everett. I mean, it would have been ludicrous for Lincoln to give a kind of long-winded duration after that. So um, he did precisely what he was supposed to do. Very I good. have to say, Dan, I don't know why undergraduates find our long lectures so vexing. I mean, they're brilliant <laughs> and entertaining, but they, they just don't yeah, have the attention span anymore. That's, uh, I, I, I always tell them every word is a gem. <laughs> you, know, you should you should hang on this stuff. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and they, when when we tell them that 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 crowds of people turned out to listen to the Lincoln Douglas debates, right? Uh, even without without modern uh, modern methods of amplification, uh, and 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 they were you know, apparently held spellbound by it. And and, right. and yeah, we can't keep our students' attention for fifty minutes, right? <laughs> <laughs> Is it us or them? Who knows? <laughs> well. Let's look at the address. I, I, of course, one thing that, that immediately struck me, it, 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 frankly, it's been years since I had read this speech, but how many of the phrases just jump off, jump off the page and have indeed gone down in, in history themselves, right? Uh, dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal, conceived in liberty, uh, let's see, uh, last full measure of devotion, um, uh, shall not have died in vain, a new birth of freedom, government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from this earth. Well, is this sui generis, or where, where is he, where is he, uh, uh, getting his, or, 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 or where is he getting these phrases? You know, it's a great question, and I think part of the reason that they stick with us is that they've become the titles of so many books. I, mean, I can think of a lot of books that use phrases out of the Gettysburg Address as their titles. You know, Lincoln was a brilliant writer, and you see it in his writings throughout his life, his adult life. With the Gettysburg Address, he had some, he was certainly thinking about it over a long period of time. And some of the ideas are ones that he borrowed, things like four score. There was a, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Galusha Grow, had used that phrase earlier uh, in the year and, and it had been in a somewhat well-known speech. So Lincoln would have certainly been attuned to that. The idea also comes out of the Book of Psalms in the Bible in terms of how long people will live. Lincoln knew the King James Bible very well, much of it by heart. So phrases like four score would have been something that he may have latched onto from somewhere else. It's funny, Lincoln wrote some or gave some test runs of the Gettysburg Address beforehand, and they often aren't as well known because the writing isn't as captivating as 
the phrases you described. He actually wrote a poem about the battles of Gettysburg in July of 1863. It's just a couple lines long from Robert E. Lee's perspective, where he was sort of playing with in his mind uh, what had happened in Gettysburg. And then also in July, and I'll read you a little bit of this, he was serenaded by a group of people who came to the White House who wanted to hear what he had to say in the wake of the, the Battle of Gettysburg and the surrender at Vicksburg and the July 4th celebrations. And here's just a little bit of what he said. How long ago is it, 80 odd years, since on the 4th of July, for the first time in the history of the world, a nation by its representatives assembled and declared as a self-evident truth that all men are created equal? That was the birthday of the United States of America. Now on this last 4th of July, or sorry, now on this last 4th of July just passed, when we have a gigantic rebellion, at the bottom of which is an effort to overthrow the principle that all men are created equal, we have had the surrender of a most powerful position and army on that very day. And he goes on to talk about the battle itself. You can see in that little extemporaneous speech that he gave at the White House, how long ago is it? 80 odd years? That's what Lincoln's thinking in July. How long ago? 80 odd years since we talked about a self-evident truth that all men are created equal. The idea is there and he's playing with it. By November, he gives us that memorable phrase, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation. It takes him time to get there. But as he plays with the ideas and with his brilliant intellect and writing ability, he's able to get to the words and phrases that are so memorable today. The larger point is that these are uh, these ideas or the conceptions that he describes in the speech are perfectly consistent uh, with the argument that Lincoln has been making for many years about the centrality of the Declaration uh, to the American experience. I mean, to me, the, the, the Gettysburg Address is fundamentally uh, Lincoln and remember, and let me just say parenthetically, by 1863, there's been terrible carnage and bloodshed. Of course, Gettysburg was a classic example that, you know, um, terrible battles where thousands of men were killed and annihilated. Lincoln, it seems to me, by 63, is at pains to, to come up with a kind of definition of the war or an explanation of uh, why all this carnage was necessary. And he'd been providing that or attempting to provide that since, you know, for, for a long time. I mean, if you look at his July 4th, 1861 message to Congress, um, yeah, when, when he, he attempts to provide a kind of definition in that address for why the war was a necessity and why it should be uh, fought. And at central to that definition is his conception of the United States as a place where all men were created equal, that the declaration is the fundamental document of the country, and that the country over time had fallen away from that definition thanks to the institution of slavery. So the war was to reestablish the centrality of that in, uh, in uh, the country. And further, um, just, just to, to note the unity of his argument or how his argument is consistent over time. You know, in, in July of 61, Lincoln famously says, uh, we contest for a system that allows every man an unfettered start in the uh, race of life, uh, you know, when all men are created equal. He says the same thing in the Gettysburg Address. I mean, he's constantly contending for the centrality of the Declaration and the American experience. Hmm. Uh, uh, that's right. Can I, can I add one thing? Please. It, one important point that he makes in the Declaration is changing it from a self-evident truth that all men are created equal to in the Gettysburg Address, a proposition that all men are created equal. And I think he was doing that for precisely the reasons that Dan is describing. At this point in the Civil War, there's been an incredible amount of death and destruction. It's not self-evidently true that all men are created equal. Not everyone accepts that. The Confederacy has formed a nation. Their vice president has said because of the self-evident truth that all men are not created equal. And so he uses that word proposition, which is a mathematical term, to say this is something that we are arguing for. A proposition is something that has to be proved. And so we are in this war to prove that the founders were right when they said all men are created equal. This, uh, this gets us to a question Larry Fata asks, uh, one, of our, uh, one of our listeners tonight. 
obviously not everybody liked this speech. It was the Chicago Times editorial, which takes issue specifically with the notion that uh, that this war was being fought over uh, over slavery or over some proposition of equality. Um, w at what point did this speech become uh, sort of ab above reproach and and, and 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 part of the American pantheon? I mean, to me, it goes back to my original uh, comments at the beginning of the session. Uh, I think it's part of the. Uh, uh, and this, and, and John was absolutely right about this too. Um, but you know, it's part of this kind of growing uh, sectional reconciliation over time that elevates Gettysburg and everything associated with Gettysburg, which isn't as to take away from the, the stature of Lincoln's speech itself. I mean, uh, for all the reasons we're talking about this evening, it's a wonderful speech. Uh, it's a memorable speech. Uh, he summarizes. You know, or, or he presents in a very pithy way the central issue of the war and the central paradox of the institution of slavery in the United States. I mean, he gets to it right away. But to get there, I think it's part of that larger conversation about Gettysburg within the context of how the country processes the war after it ends. Uh, to me, that's that process that helps elevate it into the kind of uh, pantheon. Mm. Okay. John? Yeah, and the, the questioner is certainly right. When Democrats saw this in November of 1863, they saw this as the first salvo in Lincoln's campaign for re-election. They saw it as a partisan document. The Chicago Times is, of course, a very famous new Democratic newspaper whose editor was arrested in 1864. So they, they don't view the, the Gettysburg Address with any sort of uh, as a great a speech of great ideas. It's after the war that that happens. Well, and, and just just to continue with the Chicago Times, if I can, um, you know, note, note how the, what the Times is contesting in this editorial. They're contesting the idea of equality. Uh, you know, the you know Lincoln is you know he does this time after time. I mean, I think one of Lincoln's central contributions to the, uh, the American political culture is his insistence that the fundamental document of the United States, the fundamental uh, uh, premise of the United States is that great second paragraph of the declaration. You know, that's what the country is all about. And the Times is saying, just by making that argument, you know, that all men are created equal, that they start, as he says in July 4th of 61, you know, we contend for a system where it allows every man an unfettered start. You know, the Democrats in, uh, of the time regard that as a partisan statement because in their view, as the Times does, it lists all of the <laughs> all of the compromises on the institution of slavery in the Constitution, and suggests that there is no equality, and to and to suggest that there is is a kind of fundamental um, uh, difference between the two parties. Uh, so that you know that's very significant. I mean, it's easy. Uh, it's easy to submit uh, dismiss the Chicago Times uh, because of its uh, you know bitter language and it's extreme partisanship, although that was not unusual with newspapers in this period on both sides. But that's a very significant difference between Lincoln and the Republicans and uh, and people like Stephen A. Douglas and, and the Democrats, although Douglas has already gone to his reward by 63, but his, his, his ideas persist. Donalism was not a term that I could find <laughs> any definition of. Except by context, just to get dragging partisan partisanship into a uh, uh, into a speech where it's not uh, appropriate, I suppose. Um, so by this time, then Lincoln's mind is made up that this war is going to be about uh, about abolishing slavery. Is that is that correct? I mean, this was not his position at the uh, at, at at the outset. Um, is it? It, at what point is he? Does this? I mean, is is it the? Is it as simple as saying it's the Emancipation Proclamation? And once that's done, then we know that this is now going to be a war to end slavery, slavery over a war simply to preserve the Union. Yeah, I, at yeah, this ahead, point, John. I think he's committed to emancipation. There are some shreds of evidence that cause people to wonder if Lincoln ever wavered on that, particularly during the summer of 1864, when the war was going badly and Lincoln was trying to win re-election. But my view is that after January 1st, 1863, when he issues the Emancipation Proclamation, he's fully committed. Now, 
that's not to say that union means less to him. He is, if you were to ask Abraham Lincoln in November 20th, 1863, why are you fighting the war? He would say, I'm fighting to restore the union. Union, I think, was always his primary goal. But by 1863, he believes that emancipation is a means to making reunion possible by winning the war, using the power of black men as soldiers rather than allowing them to be slaves in who support or whose labor supports the Confederacy. So union, I think, is always primary for him, but emancipation is a major part of that by this point. When he when he says new birth of freedom, is, is this merely another way of saying the abolition of slavery? I, I mean, it, it sounds like there's there's more to it than that. Could, could either of you say, or both of you preferably, say something about what's packed into that phrase? I think there's a lot packed into that phrase. I mean, Lincoln's fundamental argument uh, was and had been for many years that the country had been drifting away uh, from first principles, that the founder's vision had been abandoned or was in danger of being abandoned. Uh, that's his critique in the Peoria speech and Cooper Union time after time after time. Uh, the whole idea was, and, and also in his debates with Douglas, where, uh, of course, Lincoln famously says um, that uh, black men and women are entitled to the fruits of the labor just like I am. You know, he gives the basically a moral condemnation of the institution of slavery. So Lincoln's fundamental critique was that the country had drifted away from first principles and was in danger of becoming something that the founders had never intended. You know, this kind of slaveocracy or slave power or this... Uh, something uh, that had uh, was absolutely contrary to the original spirit and vision of the founders. So his, you know, the phrase "new birth of freedom" means a kind of going back. You know, James McPherson calls it uh, the second re Amer revolution. You know, the idea that you're going to re-embrace uh, these fundamental principles that the country's fallen away from over the course of uh, several decades preceding the war, and that's the new birth of freedom. Excellent. John? Yeah, I think that's right. And I think that the other aspect of it is that this is a, as, as Dan has alluded to, this will include black people, that they will be included within the people. When he says a new birth of freedom, that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. I think he's, he's including all people in that and and you see even hints of that in the dred scott speech that dan alluded to um at the very that's the speech he gives in june of 1857 where in response to this terrible decision by the supreme court lincoln shows how historically inaccurate roger tawney's opinion was in saying that african americans are not citizens and cannot sue in the federal courts and at the very end of that speech Lincoln says, we desired them to be considered citizens, at least so far as would give them a hearing in court. And then he talks about slave women as having a, a right of consent. And so I think by, in 1857, he's, he's starting to wrestle with this idea of black citizenship. And then by 1863, in the Gettysburg Address, you see it a little more fully in um, the, in the speaking of a new birth of freedom right before government of the people. And then you see it, I think, in one of his last speeches in, in his second inaugural address, where he closes by talking about a, a just and a lasting peace. What would make the peace just and lasting? It would be undoing what has happened since the founding era, undoing the stripping away of voting rights from black men. And Lincoln points out earlier in his career, when the Constitution was ratified, at least five states permitted black men to vote. Historians have actually found that it's nine states. So for Lincoln, black men were part of the people at the founding of the nation. And now he's saying we need a rebirth. We need to get back to first principles, as Dan said. At what point did was Lincoln not a, an admirer of, of colonization? And, and, a, yeah, well, he does talk about uh, advocated up until uh, basically January 1st, 63. <laughs> and then a guy yeah. falls out of his uh, pantheon. Uh -huh. Yeah, there are a few people who argue that Lincoln was advocating for it as late as 1864. But I've not really found their arguments persuasive. I think Dan is right. At, at the moment that he issues emancipation, 
the Emancipation Proclamation, colonization had been in his earlier writings, even the preliminary proclamation, I believe. It's not in the final proclamation. He takes that out. Okay. Um, and let me just, let me just, I mean, this is, I, I don't know how far we want to go down this path, but uh, Lincoln's, Lincoln's fundamental policy for many years had been gradual to, you know, how do, uh, if people ask him, how should we deal with the institution of slavery? It was restrict it, not allow it to grow outside of the South, place it on a course of ultimate extinction. And as far as emancipation, it should be gradual, compensated, and followed by colonization, which was Jefferson's and Henry Clay's uh, position as well. I mean, this is, I, I think, uh, I would characterize it as typical of a Whig, uh, and Lincoln was a Whig a lot longer than he was a Republican, uh, typical of Whig sensibilities. You know, how do, how do you take the most controversial issue in the in the country and deal with it without bloodshed, you know, because the Whigs were all about social order. So to avoid, you know, some kind of, or try to avoid some kind of terrible bloodletting, which happened in the end anyway, this was his moderate policy with regard to slavery. Okay. Um, Isabel, a little while ago mentioned uh, that, uh, uh, or John, I believe, mentioned that, that, that this, the Gettysburg Address is, uh, could be looked at as the start of Lincoln's presidential 1864 re-election campaign. Um, Isabel Smith, in that vein, asks, did the political party divide greatly affect how Lincoln spoke in this address? It's a good question. I, I would tend to think not, but I, I don't know. I, I agree with you, John. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I guess I uh, I don't see this as ex uh, particularly political speech. I mean, it's not like Lincoln is lancing the Democratic Party or taking shots, even veiled shots as his opponents. I mean, and when Lincoln wanted to do that, he he did it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, all you have to do is look. I mean, look at the debates with uh, Stephen Douglas. I mean, he wasn't afraid to be partisan. I mean, I to me this is. Um, I mean, I would be skeptical that he approached this as a way to set himself up in some fashion. Uh, for the 64 election. I think I, I, I view it more as Lincoln making this consistent argument about the centrality of the declaration. You know, here's a, here's another opportunity for me to say to the public uh, with the great battle of Gettysburg as a backdrop uh, that we need to embrace the declaration and the, and the true meaning of the second paragraph, as John so eloquently said, uh, which in, includes black Americans. Uh, you know, you know, and Lincoln was quite blunt about that. I mean, he says, I mean, one of the central issues in his debate with Douglas was to argue that, in fact, the Declaration did include black Americans. And as you know, Douglas, frankly, makes a nakedly racist appeal um, to white voters in Illinois by suggesting that they were, they were not. Black Americans were not covered. But, you know, Douglas says government by whites, for whites, you know, it's a white government. Uh, and Lincoln is at pains to refute that. So this is completely consistent with that argument, I think. Okay. Um, why don't we uh, turn for a moment to uh, William Lloyd Garrison's The War, Its Cause and Cure. Uh, I, I'm not sure which of you recommended that this be, uh, that this be included, but um, help us understand how this fits in. I, I imagine that, that it would be fair to say that Garrison liked the Gettysburg Address, um, but, uh, of course, this, this predates it by two and a half years. Um, what can you say about the, uh, the importance of, of, uh, of Garrison to all this? I'm going to say that I don't recall recommending any readings, so I'm going to have to defer to Dan. <laughs> I, did, <laughs> I didn't recommend this either, so <laughs> well, there must be some kind of mystery uh, ah. uh, uh, recommender. But, but, you know, this is, I mean, this, this is fine. I mean... Um, Gar you know, I, I I can speak to Garrison for a few minutes unless you want to start, John. I, I, I just talked for a while about, I mean, let me just say that I, I think one of the, the value of Garrison was, and it's again emphasized in this piece uh, in May of 61, Garrison always places slavery at the centrality of the crisis. You know, why is there a crisis? Uh, with, you know, why are we ending up in this civil war? It's because of the institution of slavery. Uh, not the tariff or not some other esoteric cause. I mean, Garrison, of course, is is kind of the, in many respects, the uber-abolitionist in the period. Uh, 
a very controversial <laughs> uber abolitionist, but he's certainly one of the leading, if not the leading figures. But what Garrison is constantly hammering is on is the centrality of slavery as the point of departure, as the, uh, the, the, the line between North and South upon which everything is crumbling. And he does that again in this, in this piece, um, where he says, you know, in, in one of, in the third paragraph, uh, the cause is slavery. You know, this is, this is why this whole thing is happening. Um, and as, 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 you know, as we know, thanks to the work of Charles Dew and others, uh, even people in the South, uh, who were at pains to perhaps suggest that slavery wasn't central, uh, in the heart of hearts accepted or recognized that slavery in fact was central to the whole conflict. Hmm. John? Uh, I concur. I, I don't have the document in front of me, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, it's it's my understanding that uh, Garrison and Lincoln uh, did not, uh, were not always in the warmest of terms, that Garrison kind of saw Lincoln as a squish. Uh, at what point, is it, is, is it in, in, in 1863, or is it the, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, Emancipation Proclamation that that, uh, that 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 causes Garrison to warm to him, or does he ever really warm to Lincoln? Yeah, I think the Emancipation Proclamation. I, Garrison sees the Emancipation Proclamation as a very major positive step. But if I recall correctly, even by 1864, Garrison was not. He was, if I recall correctly, not thrilled with Lincoln as. The running as the candidate for the Republican Party until very late in the campaign. Frederick Douglass was the same way. The abolitionists, Lincoln wasn't an abolitionist. And so for the abolitionists, Lincoln is a little too moderate for them. Garrison, when he founded The Liberator in 1831, published an editorial that's very famous now, where he says, I'm not going to speak with moderation. You know, if you see your wife in the hands of a ravisher, or if you see your babe in a fire, you can deal with that moderately, but I'm not going to deal with slavery moderately. I mean, that was who William Lloyd Garrison was. And for the next 35 years, he publishes this newspaper from that abolitionist perspective. Lincoln was not an abolitionist. Lincoln was a moderate political Republican. And, um, and so I think Garrison was always going to have reservations about Lincoln. Lincoln would try to persuade the abolitionists, people like Charles Sumner. He would say, look, I'm six months behind you. Just give me time to be able to do what I need to do. But the abolitionists, until the very end of the 1864 campaign, are really frustrated with Lincoln. And there were even some abolitionists after Lincoln was assassinated who, were, who actually were glad that he had been assassinated because they thought Andrew Johnson would be more radical and now the moderate Lincoln is out of the way. Now, I don't think that was Garrison's view, but there were certainly some radical Republicans in Congress who took that view of Lincoln's death. Oh, that's, that's absolutely right. And uh, just, just to add to John's fine answer, um, uh, you know, the, the classic example of Lincoln's moderation is his letter to Greeley in August of 62. I mean, Garrison would never have written that letter. Right. I mean, Lincoln famously says, uh, well, I, all I'm about is to f save the Union. And if I could uh, save the Union by freeing all the slaves, I would do that. If I could save it by freeing some and leaving others in bondage, I would do that. You know, so on and so forth. In other words, Lincoln was prepared to accept half a loaf mm -hmm. uh, with regard to slavery. Garrison as John pointed out, was an absolutist on slavery. I mean, there was no way that you could compromise on a fundamental moral issue like slavery from Garrison's perspective. So, as John suggests, the abolitionists were very critical of Lincoln. I mean, especially the first 18 months of the war. I mean, their view was once the war began, it was time to emancipate right now. You know, this was the, this was the moment. And Lincoln, to keep the border states, uh, you know, uh, happy, uh, was reluctant to do that without some kind of compensated emancipation uh, scheme, which he, you know, proposed numerous times. Um, so they were very upset with him. I mean, they, they, uh, if you look at Garrison's paper, it's filled with criticism of Lincoln. Um, and he was just savagely criticized. And as Johnson pointed out, he was not their preferred candidate in 64, uh, or many of them hoped that he would be overthrown and uh, someone else would be leading the ticket that year.
at the heart, the fight between, or the, the fight's probably the wrong word, but the but the long uh, disagreement between Lincoln and Garrison centered on the, on the Constitution, did it not? Or whether whether it was a slave owner's document or, uh, or 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 whether it looked beyond slavery. Yeah, Garrison thought the Constitution. He called it a covenant with death and an agreement with hell. And he very famously, on July fourth, eighteen fifty four. In Framingham, Massachusetts, burned a copy of the Constitution in front of a large audience and then stomped on the ashes. Frederick Douglass called the Constitution a glorious liberty document. And I think for Lincoln, the Constitution was a liberty document. If you, the way Lincoln read the Constitution was through the lens of the Declaration. And so for him, the founders had set up a system whereby slavery was on the uh, the course for ultimate extinction extinction the constitution as lincoln would point out never referred to slaves as property it refers to them as persons and so he would point to arguments like that saying the founders i think this is in the peoria address saying the founders hid away slavery as you would a when or a cancer when they put it in the constitution they didn't put it at the forefront garrison by contrast thought that the Constitution was a pro-slavery document and uh, was evil for that reason. Dan, no, that's, that? That, no, I mean, that's right. Uh, I'm absolutely right. I mean, it, it should always be remembered that uh, Lincoln was a Whig and a lawyer, and he had great reverence for the Constitution and the law. I mean, all you have to do is read his Lyceum Address and, and, and some of his other uh, uh, speeches. But the Lyceum is particularly eloquent in this regard, where, you know, in the face of uh, examples of mob violence, uh, Lincoln condemns uh, the abolition movement if it violates the law. Uh, you know, Lincoln was all about, Lincoln basically says time and again, if you're unhappy with the Constitution, well, there's a process for uh, dealing with that. It's called the amending process. If you're unhappy with the law, you have to obey it, even though you're unhappy with it. You just have to pass another law. You know, follow regular order. I mean, Lincoln famously says in the Lyceum Address, um, you know, let let the Constitution and the law be preached to every lisping babe. <laughs> you know, let it become the uh, the political religion of the land. So that was that was absolutely not uh, Garrison's view. You know, as John's pointed out, Garrison regarded the Constitution as 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 uh, filled with compromises on an issue upon which he felt there was no way to, you could compromise uh, because of its immorality. Um, Lincoln was always trying to work through what I would call regular order. You know, how can we keep the country together and avoid violence on this most sensitive of issues? Can I uh, follow up on that, but it'll sure. slightly, slightly change directions. In all, I, there's a lot of work on the Gettysburg Address that I've never read. There's a, you know, so many books and articles about it. So maybe someone has done this. But in all of the reading I've done uh, of scholars writing about the Gettysburg Address, I've never seen anyone connect it to the Lyceum Address. Yeah. And I think that the Lyceum Address, the Lyceum Address closes with a really powerful theme of remembering and valuing the sacrifices of the founding generation, cherishing what they have given us so that we don't take it for granted and lose it. Lincoln starts off the address by saying, we have the greatest nation on the face of the earth. We have a political, in, political institutions that protect civil and religious liberty. We have incredible land. We have all these things that have been given to us. He then spends the bulk of the address talking about how we're, we're running the risk of losing these things because we're not living under law and order, as Dan just described. We have mob violence everywhere, and we run the risk of losing what the founders gave us. And he closes with a theme of remembering the sacrifices of those who went before and those who gave us what we have. And I've often, I teach my courses, I use that as one of the central themes of, of my courses to try to get my students to understand the sacrifices that people generations before us have gone through so that we appreciate what we have and don't lose it and i think that's a theme that first comes out in lincoln's lyceum address but then you see it throughout his civil war era speeches when lincoln was on his way to be inaugurated in 1861 
he stops at the at Independence Hall to raise a, a flag. And he gives an extemporaneous speech. Fortunately, a newspaper reporter was there and wrote it down so we know what he said. But he says something along the lines of, as he's standing where the Constitution and the Declaration were signed, he says, I've often contemplated what it was that caused the soldiers of the revolution to fight and for this cause and to die. What was it in the Declaration that made them do that? And then you see it in his first inaugural address in that wonderful closing paragraph where he calls on northerners and southerners to remember the sacrifices of the founders remember the common bonds that tie north and south together he says the mystic cords of memory from every uh battlefield grave and i, I forget it now but i'm butchering it but you see those ideas then <coughs> excuse me in the gettysburg address where he wants Americans to take note of the struggles of the, the men who died, those who struggled here, that that nation might live. So throughout his adult life, he calls on people, remember the sacrifices of the founding generation so that you don't lose what they gave you. And then with the Gettysburg Address, he gives it a little tweak. Remember the sacrifices of those who struggled here, that that nation might live. Why? So that we rededicate ourselves to what they died for the union and now a new birth of freedom. I maybe shouldn't have said all this because I'd like to write about it someday and there's 55 <laughs> people listening in. So I hope no one takes the idea, but I thought it was something worth pointing out. Yeah. I, lo I love that too. You should you should go with that paper, John. I, I, I think the, the, the Lyceum Address has certain fundamental principles and you've just described them. Uh, so I'm not going to belabor it, but I think you're absolutely right. There's, a, there's much in the Gettysburg Address is kind of a, a, a reference uh, to those fundamental principles of bringing them forward and then updating them in light of the war. Right. Uh, but the, the, the fundamental nature of them, uh, of Lincoln's vision for the country is all laid out in that speech very early in his career. Yeah. Maybe we could talk a little more about how this speech is received. Uh, we, we, we have, uh, we've already mentioned the, uh, uh, the uh, Chicago Times scathing editorial, but how, for instance, was this uh, was this speech received in, say, the border states? That's a tough one. Yeah, yeah that's a good question. I mean, uh, the, in in general, I would say, uh, you know, the uh, border states, remember, are slave states. So they're not happy, uh, although uh, the, sla the slavery wasn't emancipated there by the proclamation. They're not particularly happy, uh, or at least slave owners, not particularly happy with the trend away from slavery. It is a bo bone of contention. But I think they also recognize, I mean, the overwhelming sentiment in places like Kentucky and elsewhere in Missouri is that it, we have to win the war. You know, the war needs to be won and victory needs to be achieved. Um, and so they would probably, I mean, I don't know, I can't think of anything, any specific references come to mind about uh, the Gettysburg Address, but I suspect that their reaction would have been something along the lines of, uh, you know, this is, this is Lincoln again, providing a kind of definition of the conflict. And we've already embraced the fact that uh, emancipation as a war measure is something tolerable. John, any... No, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure I could add anything. Sorry. Yeah. Um, well, we have uh, about seven minutes left. Uh, let me uh, let, let me just ask for closing arguments. Um, if we've got uh, fifty some teachers here, we presume that most, if not all of them, are teachers uh, who are uh, who are presumably going to, uh, to 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 bring the Gettysburg Address before their students. What should be the takeaway? What's what's the hook that the stu what uh, the teachers can use to to, uh, uh, to 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 let often skeptical students know that this is this is important not only for 1863 but for today? Dan, would do you want to go first, or I can go? It, it, I'll just say. I mean, I, I'll just say this. Um, I think the. To me, the way to approach the Gettysburg Address, and I just did this in class uh, a week or so ago, I approach it as Link another example of Lincoln defining the war, telling the American people why the war was being fought, and frankly, why it, the sacrifice that had been made, the supreme sacrifice that he refers to in his speech, uh, 
uh, was a laudable one, and that is that the country was embracing, re-embracing the ideals of the Declaration. Uh, I mean, when I do the survey course, um, I constantly emphasize when I talk, when I, you know, after the Declaration, of course, I constantly emphasize when I'm talking about the 50 years after the Declaration, you know, into the antebellum period, that the fundamental principles that the country was founded upon were uh, being forgotten. The, the country, in, in the face of all the profitability of slavery, was drifting away from those first principles. So Lincoln is constantly at pains to note that that note that that is happening in the 1850s, and then during the war, he embraces the opportunity to define why the war was necessary, and further why this new birth of freedom was a significant thing. You know, that the country was returning to those first principles. So that's how I pitch it to my students. Yeah, it's helpful to to think about that most of the people listening in are teachers because. I think we can all empathize with one another that when you teach history, whether it be at high school or college students, a lot of students just don't really care. And they, they're they just there to get the piece of paper at the end of the four years that says you've graduated. And when you have bio or psych majors who are taking it for a distribution credit, you know, they, they want to know what they need to know for the test. And, and oftentimes, maybe even that's a stretch. My students are wonderful, so don't 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 take it up in my way. I suppose I, I hear that other faculty members deal with that sort of thing. And so when I teach, I, I do a course every fall that focuses on the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, and how have those documents been interpreted throughout American history? So we, I actually, the first document I teach every semester in that course is the Lyceum Address. And if you've never read it, I, I commend it to you. It's if you're home on a Friday and you don't have anything fun and exciting to do, curl up next to the fireplace with Lincoln's Lyceum address and it'll be a, a night well spent. But in that, we've already talked about the themes of that speech where remembering the founding, what does the declaration mean? What does the nation mean? Remembering the sacrifices of those who came before you. And then we turn to the Declaration, and then we look at a lot of reform movements. So we look at abolitionism, we look at women's rights, we look at um, the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. And I try to get my students to appreciate the sacrifices of those who went before them. It could be the sacrifices of the men at Gettysburg. It could be the women who hunger struck when they were arrested at the White House during uh, World War One. It could be Martin Luther King fighting for civil rights in Birmingham, Alabama. Those are things that are tangible to the students. And I think that when you can get them to think about the themes of the Gettysburg Address or the Lyceum Address through the lens of these other areas that they may um, have more appreciation for, it then gives them an appreciation for the argument that Lincoln's making and helps them to see how it's a it's a an argument that spans centuries and that is in some ways in the American experiment timeless and that it it's still relevant to them and I and I hope that then they leave my class with a greater appreciation of what Lincoln was arguing for by seeing how it plays out in other periods in American history. Mm. Well, that's terrific, and uh, I want to thank. John, you and, and and Dan as well for your participation tonight. I want to also want to thank everyone who tuned in for uh, for the questions that you asked. As a reminder, you will be receiving an email uh, within the next week with a link for, for a certificate of participation. If you have enjoyed today's webinar, please consider taking an online graduate course through the Ashbrook Center. These are offered as part of our Master of Arts in American History and Government program. Uh, John and Dan both teach regularly in, the quest, in, the, in, in that uh, program, as do I. Uh, you can find more information about Ashbrook's online course offerings at teachingamericanhistory.org. You can help us spread the word about these programs by sharing the archive link which you will receive by, by email next week. Please share that with your colleagues as well as on social media. Our next Documents in Detail webinar will be Wednesday, January 24th, when our subject will be Theodore Roosevelt's New Nationalism speech. On that occasion, I will be joined by Dr. David Alvis of Wofford College, 
and Dr. Jason Jividen of St. Vincent College. The recommended readings for that webinar have already been posted. So we hope to see you back here on January 24th. In the meantime, on behalf of everyone at Teaching American History, we wish you all the happiest of holidays and, uh, and a successful end to your semesters. Good night.